Well, good evening. I want to encourage you to turn to Philippians chapter 1. And as you're turning to shepherds of this church, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here, to share in your work, to share in your lives. We have an assembly of brothers and sisters in Christ this evening, and we have visitors from other places that are very special to me. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It's Monday night. Uh, Before I started preaching full-time, I sold pharmaceuticals for three years, and I know what it's like to work all day on a Monday night and to be tired and to grab a quick bite of food and get to the gospel meeting, and I appreciate you being here tonight, and we're going to make the most of our of our time together because we're going to spend our time thinking about Jesus. The church here this year is thinking about the nature and the attributes of God, and I'm talking about Jesus within the context of how he shows us God. And tonight we're thinking about the theme of Jesus is life. And so I am going to encourage you to turn to Philippians chapter 1, and I'm going to point you to verse 21. That's the last verse that we will consider tonight. I'm going to use a lot of scripture. The majority of the scriptures that I'm going to use are are going to be on the slides on the screen. My hope in this lesson is that you will, at the conclusion of it, think to yourself, I I, I need to to know more about Jesus. I, I long to know more about him. I am going to spend some time. I'm going to spend some of my time with with my Bible thinking about some of the things that Jason talked about tonight. Jesus is life. I think the origin of this lesson for for me was, was this famous quote that's attributed to Oscar Wilde. He said, to live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist. That is all. Well, I don't want to exist. I don't want that to be the sum of my life. I I want to live. And so as we think about life and as we think about living life, there are two sources of wisdom that we can look to that has a lot to say about living. And so when we consider the wisdom of the world and and we ask the world, what, what is life? There are just a number of answers that the world would give us concerning what life is and what life is is all about. When I was growing up, there was this series of of t-shirts that were very popular. And so uh, the one that I liked the most said, basketball is life. And so it would have a basketball on the front of the shirt and it would say, basketball is life. But if basketball wasn't your game, then there was one that said, football is life or baseball is life. And so when we consider the, the world in which we live, the world says, Life is about being popular. Life is about power. We live in Northern Virginia now, and we've got a front row seat for people that are longing for power, and we've got a front row seat for people that once they get that power, they want more power, and once they have gotten some power, they will do any and everything to hold on to that power because they believe that power is life. For others, it's just prestige. For others, it's just the pursuit of pleasure. And so for some people, they would define their life as as another person. They live for their husband or their wife, or they live for their child or their children or their grandchildren. There are those who live to travel, and they haven't even begun to enjoy the trip that they're on before they are planning the next one. There are others who Their entire lives revolve around money. And so I I made this observation yesterday, and I I said that uh, I was going to, I'd intended to save this line for tonight, but some of you weren't here uh, yesterday, so it'll it'll be fresh to you. But for those of you that have seen the announcement, don't let Annandale, Virginia fool you. I am an Alabamian. I was born and raised in Winfield, Alabama. And I know that you know that we know what it looks like to be all in. We know what it looks like to care about something so passionately 
that we think about it 365 days a year and we talk about it 365 days a year and there are clothes that some of us would never ever wear and there are clothes that some of us proudly wear to communicate to other people this matters to me this university this football team this matters to me we know what it means to be all in and to go all out. The wisdom of the world would say to us that life is it's just about whatever you want it to be. Just find what you like and, and go get it with, with all that is in you. But there's another source of wisdom that we can turn to, and that is the wisdom that is from above. And that's where we began yesterday in thinking about Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Well, he is, he is the word of John 1, 1 through 18. And so the gospel of John begins by defining Jesus as, as God himself. And so what did God do? God became flesh and he dwelt among us. And when he became flesh and dwelt among us, he entered the world the same way that all of us enter the world. He was born of a woman. And so he was a baby, and then he was a 12-year-old boy, and then he was a, a, a teenager, and he was a young man. And at 30 years of age, he began to teach and to preach, and he began to talk about himself. And little by little, he revealed more and more about himself until he died, and there were those who he had made such an impression on through his teaching and his preaching and his behavior, that their reaction to his death was, truly, this was the Son of God. And so Jesus would talk about himself and he would say, listen, I know where I'm from. I am from above. And so what we have in, in the wisdom that is from above, what we have in, in the Bible, is, is an Old Testament that is pointing to the person of Jesus. And, and what we have in Acts through Revelation are, are books and letters that are pointing back to the book of Jesus. And so what we have in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, we have the, the wisdom of the Proverbs. We have the wisdom that is personified in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. We have in Jesus Christ the embodiment of that. Who is this Jesus? He's the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him dwells present tense. Colossians 2.9 When the word became flesh and dwelt among us, he didn't stop being God. He became the God-man. In him, Colossians 2.9, present tense dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so John would write to us in, in the Gospel of John and he would say, listen, this is who Jesus really is. And, and I'm writing this that you may believe the truth about Jesus. And then at the end of his life, John writes 1 John, and in chapter 1, verse 1, he refers to the word of the gospel of John as the word of life. 1 John 1, 1, who is the word of life? He is the one who said of himself in John 14, 6, I am the life. He is the one who said in John 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life, present tense, on the earth, under the sun. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus is not talking about eternal life. He's talking about our present life. And Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. To live is me. And Jesus would say to us in John 14, 3, and in other passages, to die is gain. This really is the conclusion of the lesson. I mean, I'm going to talk about some more things for, for a few minutes this evening, but this really is the conclusion of the lesson. When you think about your life tonight and you are honest with yourself, you know, you know what your life is about. You know what you think about and you know what you talk about and, and you know what you do because... 
What you do is what matters to you. When you think about your life tonight, and, it, and it's just, it's just a, a conversation between you and the true and living God. After all the games have been played and all the teams and players are gone, after all the people you have lived for are gone, after all the places have been seen, after you've gotten all the money and popularity and power and pleasure and prestige you've sought, what then? What then? To live is money, to die is to leave it all behind. All of it. You can't take any of it with you. The ancient Egyptians taught us that. In time, that's the wisdom from above going all the way back, the wisdom from below going all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. To live is fame, to die is to be forgotten. There are a lot of famous people in the world that I wouldn't recognize if I ran into them, had a conversation with them. It is interesting. I mean, I grew up, you know, and it's, it's college football, right? And we you don't live here and not declare allegiance to one of two teams, right? And so we've been in Northern Virginia long enough to know that there are people who feel the same way about the Washington Redskins that were the Washington football team and now they're the Washington Commanders. I mean, there are people and their whole life revolves around that NFL football team and they spend all of their money on season tickets and going out to... To, to Maryland where FedEx Field is and they, and they tailgate before their game and, and everything is about that team. I wouldn't recognize a single one of the Washington football team players, Washington Commanders players, if they walked into this assembly tonight. There are people that feel the same way about the Washington Capitals hockey team. I, I, don't, I don't know who any of those guys are. One, one of my favorite illustrations of this, and you can Google this, it's hilarious. I mean, one of the richest Americans in our country is Jay-Z, and he got on the subway one time in New York and had this entire conversation with this woman, and she didn't know who he was, didn't have a clue, and didn't care, which is what made it so funny because of her just, you know, unimpressedness of him, right? To live is power, to die is to lose it all. What are you living for tonight? What is your life all about? You know, when we share the gospel, whether we're talking to, to somebody during the week or whether we have the opportunity to teach a class or to preach a sermon, you know, the hope that we, that we all have as, as, as teachers and preachers is that we'll have somebody that is listening who, who needs Jesus. And so if you're in our assembly this evening and you, you don't even know that you need Jesus, you just know that you're running on empty. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. If you are not living your life in Christ, then you are not living. And that's a problem that has a solution. And the solution's name is Jesus. 1 John 5, 12, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Are you running on empty? tonight? Well, I've got good news for you. His name is Jesus, and what Jesus is calling us to see about himself is what the Apostle Paul came to believe and what he communicated to the church at Philippi in chapter 1, verse 21. He said, look, there are things in this, in this earthly life, in this world that I'll do if I'm here. I'll go if I'm here, I'll see and I'll do and all that, but y'all need to know that this is where the Lord wants all of us to be, to, to be. And I think one of the great challenges for all of us, if we're not there yet, is to get there. And so the question becomes, how do I get there, right? And in large part, that is what the book of Philippians is about. The Apostle Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, how did he get there and how do we get there? How do I get there? Well, it all comes back to Jesus. 
And so who is this Jesus? Well, he's, he's not just another. He's not just another anything. Everything about him is unique. He is a single being. Jesus is the only begotten God, the only begotten Son of God, and He is not a way or a truth or a life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so, of the three things that Jesus claims to be in John 14, verse 6, I just want us to think about Him saying that that I am the life. What's he talking about there? Well, what he's talking about is is vitality, right? We understand what it means to be alive, and and we understand death. And so what Jesus is saying, listen, I am the opposite of death. Who is this Jesus? He is the great I am who is from everlasting to everlasting, right? And so why did the Word become flesh and dwelt among us? Again, you make that list. It's a great list. And John 1.18 is the beginning of that list. Why did he become flesh and dwell among us? Well, because he wanted to declare God to us. He wanted to make God known to us. And so how are we ever going to begin to understand a being that, that we are not like? We are flesh and blood. He is spirit. How are we ever going to understand him? That's a problem. And here's God's solution to it. And his name is Jesus. And so the Word becomes flesh and He dwells among us. And so when you make that list of why did He do that, you know what James tells us? He tells us that God cannot die. Do you know why God cannot die? Because God is spirit. What does that mean? Well, that, that means He doesn't have flesh and blood. As an image bearer, do you know who you are tonight? Do you know what you are? You are flesh and blood, something that that God in in His form in eternity is not, but within you is a spirit that, that He created, that He made, that He sustains by the word of His power. Your spirit had a beginning, but it will never have an end. And so why did the word become flesh and dwell among us? Among other reasons, at the top of the mountain of reasons why He came is so that He could die. What is death? By definition, it's separation. Physical death is the separation of the spirit from the body. I have never seen a person's spirit leave their body. But I have watched a number of people die. And when they died, I knew they had died. There was no more vitality. They were the opposite of alive. And Jesus comes into this world that is just full of problems and he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He is the source and giver of life. By him all things were created. He is the author of life. When he became flesh and dwelt among us, in him was life. The word of life was manifested and seen. We can have everlasting life in in him in eternity, but in, in time we can walk in the light of his life. The life that now is and of that which is to come is beautifully manifested in the person of Jesus in the flesh. He abolished death and he brought life and immortality to life. Who is this Jesus? He is the true God. And he brings with him and he offers unto us the gift of eternal life. The walking dead are those who have not accepted the way, the truth, and the life. And that's the point of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. There are people who are dead in their sins and their trespasses, but they're still thinking, and they're still talking, and they're still doing. They're not like Lazarus. They're not dead and buried in the tomb. To be spiritually dead is to still be able to think and to speak and to behave. And so the walking dead in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3... 
they're thinking and they're talking and they're doing things that separate them from God. And so death, by, by, by definition, it just means separation. And so physical death is the, is, the, is the separation of the spirit from the body. We understand that, right? Spiritual death, it is the separation of our spirit from our God who is spirit. And so what does Jesus do for us? Among other things, he sends the spirit of truth to reveal the way and the truth and the life, to reveal him. I mean, that's the work of the spirit that Jesus talked about at the end of the gospel of John. Listen, there are many things that I want to tell you and there are many things that you're going to need to remember. And so what I'm going to do and what my father in heaven is going to do is we are going to send the spirit of truth and he will testify of me so that you can know me, so that you can know our Father in heaven. He sends the Spirit of life to give life. As I love John 11 so much, and I'll pause here to preach my sermon about it. Do you know what is so special about God revealing His name to us as, as this Hebrew verb that, that literally means to be? I am. Do you know what is so special about that? Among other things, what is so special about that is that he is the God of the present tense. He doesn't say, I was. He doesn't say, I will be. He says, I am. Well, why is that special? Well, that's special because in John the 11th chapter, Lazarus' sisters, they, they understood that if Jesus had been there, that their brother wouldn't have died because Jesus could have healed him. And what we learn in John 11 is that Jesus pur purposefully didn't go. He purposefully did not go so that Lazarus would die. Well, that doesn't seem right, does it? I mean, that doesn't seem... Loving and gracious and merciful, does it? And I want to tell you, when I read John the 11th chapter, you know, the sister that takes Jesus to task, I, I don't blame her. That's exactly the way I would feel. I would be like, you know what, Jesus? <laughs> if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So here's what Jesus says to her. Your brother will rise again. And, and Martha's response to Jesus is, I know and the reason why she knew is because she was a good student of Jesus's. Because Jesus talks about that in John 5. I know that too, but she knew it from John 5. She didn't have John 5 yet. She knew it because she heard him say it. And she internalized it and she believed it. And so she says in response to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And look at what Jesus says to her in John eleven twenty five. 25. He says, no, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the last day. I'm talking about right here, right now. I am not the God of the future. I am not the God of the will be. I am the resurrection and the life. Present tense. We don't have to wait on John 5, 24 through 29 because I am here. And what did he do for Lazarus? He raised him up. He, as the resurrection and the life, sends the Spirit to indwell us, to assure us of our own resurrection. In the new covenant of the life-giving Spirit, we are being transformed into the glorious image of Jesus. And as a result of Him and this hope, to live is Christ and to die is gain. When you can't decide which sermon to preach on the Monday night of the gospel meeting, you just preach all of them. So, so far I think I've preached at least two, maybe three lessons this is a standalone lesson. This is a great list. I, I love that it's seven things. The number seven in God's word is, is symbolic of completeness, of perfection. And when you start looking at scriptures that communicate that the solution to our problem of running on empty is Jesus because he is the fullness. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's full of grace and truth. He fulfilled the old covenant. He will fill you up to overflowing with the fullness of God. 
you need to receive from his fullness. And that's, that's what John is telling us about, about the word who became flesh. He came into his own and his own received him not. But to those who received him, he gave them the right to become the children of God, those who believe in his name. You can only be full in him. The letter to the Colossians begins and ends with Jesus and it says, listen, this is what you need to understand about Jesus. He is the preeminent one and he needs to be the preeminent one in your life. We need to know more about Jesus than we, than we need to know about the starting quarterbacks of our favorite football team over the last 50 years. We need to know more scriptures than we do statistics of a college football player who played football for four years when he was 18 and 19 and, and 20 years of age. Jesus should matter more to us than anything. And until he does, we are going to be lacking. We will never be full. There is nothing about the world that will fill the longing within us because we haven't been created in the image of the world. We've been created in the image of God. And he designed us in such a way that we would need him and that he would come to us and draw near to us and complete us. And it is only in Christ Jesus, Colossians 2.10, that we can be complete and so the invitation of Jesus is just come to me and be filled. I am the bread of life. Come and eat of me and you won't ever be hungry. But when we think about Oscar Wilde's quote and we think about all those different things that the world says, hey, this is what life is about and you should do this. You should think about this and talk about this and, and behave like this. And we think about the conclusion of that, right? And so what then? If Jesus is life, then here's our what then. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For if we live, we live to the Lord and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. If Jesus is life, then here's our what then. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. If Jesus is life, then our what then is the most glorious what then of all. Because what Jesus is saying to us as he gives us this glorious opportunity to be adopted into his family of which he is the firstborn among many brethren. What Jesus is saying to us is, look, I'm not just going to allow you in me and through me to be, an, to be an heir. If we are going to live in a chapter of the Bible, as the people of God for such a time as this, Romans 8 is where we ought to live. And in Romans 8 we learn we're, we're not just heirs we are joint heirs do you hear that tonight Jesus is willing and Jesus longs to share his glory with you he didn't consider it robbery to, to hold on to the equality that he shared with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in eternity. And he emptied himself and he, he took on the form of a bondservant, of a slave, so that you and I could experience 
a transformation in which we would be conformed to His glorious body where we could be joint heirs together with Him. So what's the conclusion of Romans 8? We are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. And nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so once we... we come to Jesus, the only thing that can separate me from him is me. I am the only thing that can separate me from him. And the way I do that is by choosing to no longer live my life in him. If I ask him to let me go, he will. But so long as I abide in him, I have the assurance of his voice. I have the assurance of salvation. Is that your hope tonight? If it's not, I want to tell you, it's not because it, it can't be. It, it, it's not a hope that I have and, and others in this assembly have because we are special. It's a hope that we have because he is special. He is the most special. He is the name that is above all names because of who He is and because of what He did and because of what He is doing and because of what He is going to do. And so how do we begin our life in Him? Well, by listening to His voice and just obeying it. And so as we seek to understand the the nature of God and the attributes of God, Jesus Himself is who explains to us the truth about the true and living God. He helps us to understand God the Father and He helps us to understand the Holy Spirit. And before He ascended to the right hand of the throne of God, where He sat down upon the throne of His father David as the root and the offspring of David, where He present tense reigns as the Lord of lords and the King of kings. He said, here's what I want you to do because all authority belongs to me. I want you to go into all the world and I want you to preach the gospel and he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And so I want you to make disciples and when you make a disciple, I want you to baptize that one in the name singular of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And so to the church at Rome in Romans 6, 4 through 6, we have this this idea this concept, this command that Jesus gave in 28, 19, Romans 6, 4 through 5, it fleshes that out for us. Why is that the will of God? Well, because through obedience to the gospel, we are united with Christ in His death and resurrection. We are raised by the glory of the Father and we are given the indwelling Spirit of God to give us life. And it's because the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us that gives us the hope of resurrection. Romans 8, 9 through 11. And so when somebody obeys the gospel, what do they do? Well, they they become one with the God who is one. They commit themselves and they covenant with God, the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Have you done that in your life? When we do that, we're saved by grace through faith. It's the work of God. And so when we think about Jesus' life, this is not just another subject that we think about and we talk about and we, we play at. This literally is a matter of life and death. And this idea begins with Moses, right? And so is Moses the the type and the shadow of Jesus, right? As he is leading the people of God into the physical promised land, he says, listen, this is what God is doing. He is setting before you a choice. And you get to choose, but you need to know that your choice is going to have consequences. And so you you can choose life and you can live, or you can choose death and you can die. It's It's your choice. But here's what you need to know. You can't choose the world and and love life and see good days because the world doesn't care about you. The world doesn't love you. The world lies under the sway of the wicked one who is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. 
Why would we think that the world would tell us the truth about anything? Because it lies under the sway, the influence of the wicked one. And so what did God do? God entered into the world in the person of Jesus for the select purpose, John 16, 33, of overcoming the world. And Jesus would say, look, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have pressure. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world and in me and through me to the glory of God, you too can overcome. When we think about Philippians 1 verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I believe that if you are not ready to die, then you are not ready to live. And I want to tell you one of the things that has upset me the most about some of my brothers and sisters in Christ during the pandemic is that it has just exposed a lot of us when it comes to this business of loving this world and not wanting to leave it yet. Why are we afraid to die if we are in Christ Jesus? Some of you knew my dad. He's been gone now for almost two years. And one of the things that my dad would do to my sister and I that we hated so much is on the Lord's Day, you know, he would get up early and he'd get ready and then he'd get us up and it would be all this stuff, you know, get your head out of the bed and all that nonsense stuff. And on the rare occasion that we had the opportunity to turn the tables on him and we, we could, you know, sort of go to him that he needs to get ready, he would say to us, I stay ready. That way I don't have to get ready. Listen to me very carefully tonight. That is what Jesus does for us. He helps us to get ready to die so that we can stay ready to die. And here is the truth, the hard truth that we all have to come to terms with. You are going to die. I have been around death my entire life because my Christians were parents, because my parents were Christians and my grandparents were Christians. And all my life, I've been going to funerals. And I think that's one of the advantages that we have as the people of God. We think more about death than the, average, than the average person in the world. We go to funerals and we talk about life under the sun and, 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 and how fragile it is. And, and we talk about Ecclesiastes, that it's better to go to the house of mourning than it is to go to a party. And we share in those lessons that why is that true? I'd rather go to a party than to go to a funeral. Well, you don't learn anything at a party. But when you go to a funeral... You take things to heart. You are going to die. And I'll tell you, I, I've been alive long enough that i got a list of ways that I don't want to die. There are a lot of horrible ways to die. And here's another hard truth that we got to come to terms with. You don't get to choose. And you don't know. You don't know how you're going to die. But what you can know is that you are going to die. It's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And so Jesus would say, listen, here's the problem. The problem is not that you're going to die. I've solved that problem for you. The problem is that you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. And he would say, if you do not believe that I am, here's what's going to happen. You're going to die in your sins. In other words, you're not ready to die. But if you are willing and you do come, and you do believe, here's what Jesus will do for you. He'll free you from the bondage of sin and death when you die with Him. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, He Himself likewise shared in the same, that through death He might destroy Him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Have you allowed Jesus to do that for you? And that's what the invitation of Jesus is about, right? It's about you. 
you come to me. I am. You are. You come to me. And this is what I'm going to do for you. And so we continue to read throughout the New Testament and we come to see that, hey, these words, they weren't just about Saul of Tarsus who becomes Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles. These words were always intended to be about all of us. Who is Saul of Tarsus? Who is Paul? He, he's just a pattern. And what did God do in this pattern? He, he shows us in Paul, here, here's what I'll do for you. You think you're beyond saving? Look at this guy. Look at all the sins that he committed against God and God's people and against God's church and how he was trying to stop Christianity in his tracks before it ever began. And he found forgiveness. He found grace. He learned better and he did better. And he is the one that writes the words, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Our Savior Jesus Christ, here's what he does for me. Here's what he can do for you. He can abolish death and he can bring life and immortality to light through the gospel. And he puts death in perspective for us. Death is not the end. It is just a transition. That's all it is. And it hurts. Because it is our last enemy. And it's ugly. And there's just nothing pleasant about it. But at the end of the day, if we are in Christ Jesus, we can weep with those who weep, but we can rejoice with those who rejoice who have translated into the presence of God. And that's what those who have gone on before us, who love the Lord, that's what they've done. And so one of the last things I said to my dad was go be with Jesus. We'll be right behind you. You believe that tonight? I believe that. And that is why for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Die so that you might live. That you might live in and through and with Jesus. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Thank you for being here tonight. If you have not given your life to Jesus and you're not living in him and through him and to his glory, then you are dead in your sins and trespasses and the only cure for what ails you is the blood of Jesus. And there is a fountain free. And Jesus came in the flesh so that he could shed his blood because the life is in the blood, Leviticus 17 verse 11. And it's in baptism that we call upon the name of the Lord And in baptism, in full assurance of faith, as we call upon his name, his blood washes away our sins. And the promise that we have in him is that he's going to remember them against us no more. In other words, we don't have anything to worry about on the day of judgment because our certificate of death has been paid in full by Jesus himself. And so we can go on our way rejoicing, living abundantly, in him and through him and to his glory until he comes again. Jesus helps us to get ready to die. Jesus helps us to stay ready to die. Have you allowed him to do that for you? That's the point of this song and this invitation.